All right, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. You don't look nearly as bleary-eyed as I expected. Um, the, uh, I'm joined today by um, Ben Rhodes, the President's Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, and Ambassador Mike Froman, who is the United States Trade Representative. Uh, Ambassador Froman has, uh, as you would expect, primarily focused on the aspects of the President's trip that's focused on the economy and strengthening uh, the American economy and expanding uh, economic opportunity for uh, Americans back home. Uh, that is, as you would expect, a, you know, a core component of uh, the President's agenda while he's out here. Uh, so Mike's got a couple of uh, uh, things to talk to you about. Then we'll turn over to Ben, who will do uh, a review of some of the other aspects of the agenda uh, that the President has been discussing uh, in the context of these APEC meetings, but also uh, what we'll be focused on in the context of the President's bilateral meetings with uh, President Xi that will begin later on this evening. Uh, and then after that, you know, the three of us will be up here to take uh, questions you have on any topic. Uh, we'll do this for 45 minutes or so. All right. Ambassador Fruman, would you like to start us off? Great. Uh, well, thanks, Josh. And I'd like to start with uh, an announcement on uh, an important breakthrough we had in our negotiations uh, with China on the Information Technology Agreement, or ITA. And that's news that the President uh, just shared with his other APEC uh, leaders at the, uh, the Leaders' Summit. Uh, last night, we reached a breakthrough in our ongoing efforts to expand the Information Technology Agreement. This is a WTO agreement that eliminates tariffs on high-tech products among 54 economies, including uh, the U.S. and China. And to give you some idea of the importance of this agreement, the last time the WTO agreed to eliminate tariffs on IT products was in 1996, when most of the GPS technology, much of the medical equipment, software, high-tech gadgetry that we rely on in our daily lives didn't even exist. Uh, in fact, since that time, global trade in these types of high-tech products have reached $4 trillion and annually, and despite that explosion of trade, the coverage of the ITA of products has never been expanded. And so that's why for the last two years, we've been working uh, to, uh, very intensively with our global partners to expand the Information Technology Agreement. But unfortunately, during the summer of 2013, those talks broke down due to disagreements over the scope of coverage, what list of products would be covered by the agreement, with most countries led by the U.S. working to achieve an ambitious outcome. Uh, since that time, the United States and China have been working to close our differences, but without a breakthrough sufficient to resume the plurilateral negotiations in Geneva. And that changed here last night with an agreement between the U.S. and China that we expect will pave the way for the resumption of ITA negotiations in Geneva and their swift conclusion. And that will be the first major tariff-cutting agreement in the WTO 17 years. At a time when there have been a lot of FTAs and other regional arrangements, the WTO hasn't actually cut tariffs in 17 years, and the ITA presents the first opportunity uh, to do that. This is encouraging news for the U.S.-China relationship. It shows how the U.S. and China work together to uh, both advance uh, our bilateral economic agenda, but also to support the multilateral uh, trading system. And it also underscores the importance of, of institutions like APEC, regional organizations. APEC actually gave birth to the ITA back in 1996. It's always been a key part of the ITA. The APEC leaders have always called for swift conclusion of the ITA. So this is an, another indication of the utility of forums like this. Industry estimates have concluded that uh, successfully concluding the ITA would eliminate tariffs on roughly a trillion dollars of global sales of IT products would contribute to global GDP $190 billion and would support up to 60,000 additional U.S. jobs in technology and manufacturing, and by also boosting productivity around the world, and particularly in developing countries. So we're going to take what's been achieved here in Beijing uh, back to uh, Geneva and work with our WTO partners. And while we don't take anything for granted, we're hopeful that we'll be able to work quickly to bring ITA to a successful conclusion, and that'll help support good-paying jobs in the states where we lead the world in creating and selling uh, made in America high-tech products that the world is hungry to buy. Uh, let me conclude just by the word, perhaps, about TPP, which has obviously been another area of major focus uh, while we're here. Uh, as you all know, the President Obama uh, convened the TPP leaders yesterday. They had a very productive conversation. It was a good opportunity to take stock of where we were in the negotiations, to provide political impetus and guidance in terms of resolving uh, the remaining issues. Um, all the leaders uh, made clear in that joint statement uh, that we've narrowed uh, 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 many of the gaps 
There's still work to be done, uh, but the end of these important negotiations uh, is coming into focus. And that's awfully important to the United States from a number of perspectives. Uh, it's with 40% of the global economy uh, covered by TPP, some of the fastest growing markets in the world. Successfully concluding TPP will help support jobs, promote growth, strengthen the middle class in the United States. It's a key part of our rebalancing strategy, it underscores how the U.S. is embedded in this region and how the economic well-being of this region is integrally uh, uh, related to the well-being of the economy uh, in the United States. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Okay. Uh, great. I'll just uh, give a brief uh, preview of uh, the President's upcoming meetings uh, here in China. Um, and uh, then we can take your questions on um, uh, Mike's uh, issues or uh, any other issues in foreign, foreign or domestic policy. Um, in, with respect to the uh, bilateral visit here to China, um, the two issues uh, that we've uh, highlighted over the course of the last two days, I think, are uh, the key priorities that we were able uh, to get done and closed out uh, around this bilateral visit. Um, that is the visa uh, announcement that was made yesterday uh, and then the bilateral understanding on uh, ITA that was reached today. Um, I think which speaks to uh, the significance and dynamism of the U.S. economic, uh, U.S.-China economic relationship. Um, today at APEC, uh, that is clearly going to be broadened out into a discussion on regional issues related to uh, trade and uh, economic cooperation, uh, as well as a number of uh, other areas. Um, but as you know, tonight the President will have a, a dinner uh, with President Xi Jinping of China um, to kick off the state visit portion uh, of our time here in Beijing. Uh, and then tomorrow uh, the two leaders will have bilateral meetings as well. Um, in addition to uh, discussing um, and marking the progress that's been made on these uh, bilateral economic issues, uh, they'll also discuss a range of other um, bilateral and global issues uh, that are of mutual interest to the United States and China. Um, specifically, uh, I'd expect uh, there to be a discussion around uh, our cooperation on uh, clean energy and climate change um, as our two countries uh, prepare for uh, the ongoing international climate negotiations um, uh, heading into next year. Uh, we'll have a discussion of a number of regional security issues, uh, among them uh, our shared commitment to denuclearization uh, on uh, the Korean Peninsula, um, as well as uh, the uh, security environment in the broader Asia-Pacific region, uh, including uh, our interest in maritime security uh, and the situation in the South and East China Sea. Uh, we'll discuss uh, our military-to-military -military relationship uh, and what we can do um, to develop uh, a greater uh, dialogue uh, and cooperation and confidence-building measures uh, working together. Um, there, there will certainly be a discussion uh, of the ongoing uh, talks in Iran uh, with uh, Iran over its nuclear program. Uh, and Secretary Kerry uh, will be joining uh, the President from uh, Oman where he's been in a trilateral uh, dialogue with uh, the Foreign Minister of Iran and uh, Kathy Ashton from the European Union. Um, Cybersecurity, um, of course, will be an important uh, focus for the President. Uh, given some of our uh, concerns uh, related to cybersecurity and uh, uh, the uh, theft of intellectual property. Um, Afghanistan is an area where uh, we are looking to cooperate with China. We've uh, very much welcomed President Ghani's visit here to Beijing in the year and believe that China can be a partner uh, in promoting uh, development uh, and stability in Afghanistan going forward. Um, global issues like Ebola and ISIL uh, will certainly be a part of the discussion. Uh, and we've worked with China to enlist them in the effort to fight uh, the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. Uh, and then, of course, um, as is always the case when we uh, meet with China, we'll have a discussion around areas where we have differences, uh, not just cybersecurity, but uh, issues related to uh, human rights and universal values. So there'll be a very broad agenda. Uh, I think we've already had uh, very good progress on our leading economic priorities heading into the visit uh, with uh, the ITA and visa understandings that were reached. Uh, I think that shows the ability to identify areas of practical cooperation with China, even as we're, uh, of course, going to have differences uh, on a range of other uh, political, economic, and, and security issues. Um, and so tomorrow uh, we'll, we'll have those bilateral meetings, uh, and then the President uh, will be hosted at a lunch here. He'll have a chance um, to meet with a range of uh, Chinese officials before leaving for the e EAS and ASEAN summits in Nipida. So with that, we'll move to questions. Let's get started. Julie, do you want to? Take us off. I have a question for Mike and one for Ben also. Mike, can you say exactly what the 
U.S. and China agreed to that led to the breakthrough, and then with the Obama and Xi bilat starting, you know, the president has invested a lot of personal time in trying to build a relationship with Xi. At the same time, China has continued to be provocative on cyber and maritime issues. How do you see their personal relationship at this point, and how does that affect the conversations over the next few days? Sure. So the ITA is basically a list of tariff lines that are to be covered by tariff elimination. And we now have agreed to more than 200 tariff lines, representing about a trillion dollars of trade, to be covered by the ITA. And some of the, for the last six months, we've been focused not just on the quantity of the lines, but the quality of the lines. And the lines that have the greatest potential, for example, for U.S. exports, where the U.S. plays a leading role, areas of expected future growth. So things like high-end semiconductors, where there are tariffs up to 25 percent currently. We already export over $2 billion of high-tech, high-end semiconductors, even with 25 percent tariffs. So eliminating those tariffs will obviously expand that trade significantly. It's an area where we have a comparative advantage and where we can support a lot of good, well-paying American jobs. Medical equipment, MRIs, CAT scans. We export more than $2 billion of those products a year, and they face high tariffs around the region, 8 percent in some places, and as well as tariffs elsewhere. This will eliminate those tariffs and allow us to expand our exports. Same is true on, on some of the uh, high-tech instruments that become components in advanced manufacturing that we're very much involved in. So those were some of the uh, issues that, uh, that we had a breakthrough on that will allow the negotiations now to move forward uh, in Geneva. Sure, Julie, on your uh, second question, um, you know, the President has invested a good deal of time and energy in his relationship with President Xi. Um, you know, I think if you look at the breadth of the agenda, um, it's, you know, clearly, uh, as Secretary Kerry said, um, the most consequential bilateral relationship in the world. And what they were able to do at Sunnylands is cover this whole spectrum of issues. Um, and in fact, actually, the ITA came up uh, at Sunnylands, so this was uh, a, an area of uh, uh, focus on our trade agenda. Um, and I, I think what the President was able to do is convey uh, in that meeting um, uh, his thinking on all these issues, both strategically and at, at a tactical level. Uh, and he was able to hear uh, the same from President Xi. Uh, again, Xi Jinping has clearly uh, established himself um, as a, a, a strong and assertive leader here in China. And the way we look at the relationship is uh, there, at any given time, are going to be areas where we can identify ways to make progress. Uh, and then there are going to be areas uh, where we're going to have differences. Um, and uh, I think we've been opportunistic in saying, okay, where do we have an agreement that we can drive the relationship forward on something like visas or ITA, uh, but on, frankly, the global security issues like Iran and North Korea, the Chinese have been constructive partners in the Iran negotiations. Uh, they've played a constructive role um, in uh, being unified with the P5 plus one, uh, in uh, pressing Iran to take this opportunity to demonstrate that their program is peaceful. In North Korea, they've taken a very strong line uh, to uh, support the notion that denuclearization has to be the goal uh, of any uh, discussions um, with North Korea. Um, when we look at um, the global issues, uh, we've encouraged China to play a more uh, assertive role uh, on things like Ebola. Uh, we want them to be stepping up to the plate uh, and uh, kicking in more uh, resources. So we welcome uh, the desire from China that is clearly on display here at this summit uh, to play a role uh, in the international community commensurate to its uh, economic and uh, political standing and its uh, standing as the world's most populous nation. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to be very clear when we believe that China's actions are actually pushing outside the boundaries of what we believe to be uh, the necessary international norms uh, that govern the relations between nations and the ways in which we resolve disputes. And so when we see things on uh, cybersecurity where uh, we have uh, Chinese actions uh, that, uh, again, uh, disadvantage U.S. businesses or uh, steal intellectual property. Uh, we're going to be very candid about that. Uh, on maritime security, um, what we've said is we're not a claimant, um, but there cannot be a situation where uh, a bigger nation is simply allowed uh, to bully smaller nations. There has to be a, a means of resolving disputes through international law and international cooperation. Um, through discussion between China, for instance, and ASEAN countries on the South China Sea, 
dialogue between China and Japan uh, on issues related to the Senkakus. Uh, and to that end, actually, we welcomed uh, the meeting yesterday between President Xi and uh, Prime Minister Abe as an opportunity to reduce the tensions between those two countries. So I think the benefit of the personal relationship is that they know where they're coming from. Uh, you know, there's no mystery in our position on these issues. There's no mystery on the Chinese position. Uh, what we need to do is find when there's an opening, we take it, uh, and we run through that opening, and we work together. Uh, and when there's a difference, uh, we're just going to keep uh, raising it uh, repeatedly with China, raising it uh, in international forums like this, um, and try to find ways uh, to encourage China to, to work within an international system uh, that ultimately is going to be the best way of delivering uh, stability, prosperity, security uh, to this part of the world, uh, and also dealing with, with global challenges. All right, next. Kristen? Thank you. One for Ambassador Froman and one for Ben. Um, Ambassador, what are the remaining sticking points when it comes what are the remaining sticking points when it comes to TPP? And you say that the end of negotiations are coming into focus. What specifically does that mean? Do you have a timeline in your head for when there might be an actual deal? And Ben, can you talk a little bit about what if any specific asks President Obama will have on Ebola and ISIS when he meets with President Xi. Okay, so just to repeat, the, I'll try to repeat the questions just so everybody can hear them. Um, so the question about TPP uh, final sticking points and timeline for completion, uh, and then any requests that President Obama will make related to ISIS, uh, ISIL, and Ebola. So Mike, you want to go first? Sure. Well, with TPP, uh, it's a two-track negotiation. There's market access, and then there are the rules. In a market access, we've made very significant progress with, uh, uh, with most countries, uh, including Japan, uh, on agriculture and on autos. We've made progress. We're not done yet. There are still outstanding issues, but we're, we've made uh, quite good progress there in, in recent weeks. Uh, on the rules issues, we're working to close out issues and narrow differences on, on the remaining. I'd say areas that uh, there are still um, issues we need to work through include intellectual property rights, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, the environment. Those are three examples of areas where we're paying particular attention to to try and further narrow the differences and find appropriate landing zones. Uh, in terms of the end coming into focus, you know, I, these negotiations are an ongoing reiterative process. And at every stage, we close out issues, we narrow differences, we try and find landing zones, and then we try and build consensus around them. And I think it's becoming clearer and clearer what the uh, what, the, what the final landing zones might look like, but we still have some work to do, both to define them and then build support for them. We're going to complete it as soon as we achieve the ambitious, comprehensive, high standard we set out for ourselves, and we're all working very hard to do that. There's a lot of momentum. All the countries are very focused on doing that, but we want to make sure that we get it right. Um, Kristen, I think on Ebola, um, we've encouraged the Chinese, and they have made commitments, um, both financial commitments uh, and the provision of healthcare workers and support for healthcare infrastructure in West Africa. Um, so I think uh, we welcome those commitments. We, always, uh, we are always encouraging nations to consider ways to do more, um, but also to galvanize international action as we head into the G20, for instance. So I think at the G20, uh, this will be a topic among uh, the countries uh, in Brisbane. Uh, and China obviously has a key role to play there. So I, I don't want to suggest that it's um, kind of the lead item on the agenda, but I think given the focus that we have on Ebola right now, uh, we want to make sure we're understanding what the Chinese contributions are and then how we can work together on a collaborative basis heading into the G20 uh, to get the international community to continue to step up and provide resources. Um, on ISIL, uh, again, um, with respect to, to China, we obviously wouldn't anticipate them playing a role uh, in the military coalition. I think all the countries here um, in the Asia-Pacific region are, are share the concern about foreign fighters um, going to and from uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, so we can have a discussion uh, around those issues. I think regionally, too, um, of course, we've made clear that any lasting solution uh, is going to have to deal with the political situation inside of Syria. Um, so it's an opportunity to exchange views about um, how to bring about uh, the type of transition that could uh, ultimately end the civil war in Syria. So again, I think uh, more likely that they are going to spend a lot of their time on some of the other issues that I mentioned, Iran, North Korea, cyber, mill-mill relations, Asia-Pacific. But 
uh, we want to make sure China is invested on uh, the global agenda that uh, we're focused on. And uh, I think Ebola and ISIL clearly plays into that, particularly on the Ebola front where they can kick in significant resources. Uh, and again, Ebola is an area where what we said to the Chinese is there's both the commitments you can kick in here on Ebola um, with respect to uh, money and healthcare workers and infrastructure, but also how we're thinking about infectious disease going forward and how we have a global uh, secure, health security initiative where uh, nations are anticipating what's going to be needed uh, if there are additional outbreaks of different diseases. And we've seen airborne diseases here in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so I think we want to make sure that you know, when we talk about China playing a bigger role in the world stage, it's exactly those types of issues, you know, where uh, they can bring resources and expertise to bear uh, in fighting not just Ebola, but future infectious disease. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Ambassador Froman, please. Um, what about the TISA, the trading service agreement? There was hope that maybe uh, some steps ahead could have been done also on that uh, subject within the WTO. Uh, also, do you think that you could uh, ever close quickly the TPP without a TPA? And uh, thirdly, what about the development bank uh, for investment in infrastructures that China is building up? Is the U.S. now open uh, to have it and maybe to participate in it? Let's repeat the questions. Uh, the, the trade and service agreement uh, in the context of uh, the broader trade negotiations. Question about TPA. Uh, and what was the last one? Uh, the Development Bank. Okay. Good, Mike. Uh, well, we've had uh, quite good progress over the course of this year on the Trade and Services Agreement negotiations, several rounds and countries putting on the table uh, offers. And we have a robust work program going into next year as well. So there is a lot of work being done on that. But I, I would just put it in the context of today's announcement. I think the IDA announcement is uh, uh, a significant step in terms of showing the vitality of these plurilateral agreements where countries, like-minded countries, can come together and make progress in trade liberalization, uh, whether it's in Geneva or at the WTO or elsewhere. So uh, ITA, we took a major step forward today. TISA uh, is, is well on its way, the Trade and Services Agreement, and we have a very good work program ahead. And earlier this year, we launched the Environmental Goods Agreement negotiation, uh, which also includes China. And we hope to work well with China and the other parties in the Environmental Goods Agreement to make progress uh, on that in the, uh, in the coming uh, year or so as well. Um, on, uh, on TPP and, and TPA, our view has always been that uh, 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 the President's made clear that, he, of course, he uh, would like to get uh, trade promotion authority. He'd like to finish uh, TPP consistent with it being an ambitious comprehensive high standard agreement uh, as soon as possible. And we are working in parallel tracks on that. That ultimately, uh, the only guarantee that a trade agreement um, uh, earns the support of Congress is that we bring back a good agreement. And our focus is on bringing back an agreement that, that meets uh, those, uh, those standards. On the, uh, on the infrastructure front, uh, obviously the U.S. is uh, very active in, in the G20 and a variety of other forums, including here at APEC in talking about the importance of infrastructure and, and financing for infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, been a strong supporter of, of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. And we think it's important that whatever mechanisms are put in place, they live up to the high standards of the multilateral development banks in terms of procurement practices, environmental practices, that they have the very highest uh, standards that, that exist for international lending. Okay, go back to this side. Uh, for Ben, uh, Ben, before uh, you left on the trip, I think you met with NGOs that were doing work on human rights and democracy in Burma. What message were they giving to you, and how did you respond to them when, when they say, as they maybe have to the journalists, you know, it's not a bump in the road on the, on the reform when you have all the, the violence that's going on in some parts of the country, ethnic-related violence. This is something the United States really has to do more to stand up to. Um, how did you talk to them about that message? And then also, how do you carry that message forward to Burma? What notes will you strike so, so that the United States doesn't look like they're maybe lecturing, but rather trying to encourage further reform? Just to repeat the question for everybody else in the room. Question about uh, how you respond to concerns that have been raised by human rights advocates uh, about the slow pace of progress in Burma, and how does that impact the message that you'll deliver to Burmese officials when the President's there uh, later this week? <laughs> well, uh, David, I, yeah, I did meet with uh, a number of uh, NGOs, uh, human rights advocates, a number of Burmese uh, separately from that as well. 
uh, who are engaged in civil society there. Uh, I also talked to a lot of the um, congressional staff that is focused on these issues, given Congress's interest. Uh, you know, and I think our message is, uh, you know, I'll, let me just step back here. You know, on the one hand, uh, what we've seen in the last five years in Burma is transformational. Um, uh, an opening of a country that um, uh, had been completely closed off for decades, um, the opening of pol some political space, the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, the release of political prisoners, uh, and the initiation really of a kind of politics in Burma uh, that just didn't exist uh, several years ago. Um, but it's a country with enormous challenges and enormous needs. Um, it has a lot to do. Uh, and you don't complete those types of transitions uh, quickly or easily. Uh, this is going to take uh, years uh, to work through all the different issues that have to be addressed um, inside of Burma. Uh, however, again, I think we need to uh, be practical about the timelines associated with those transitions. When we look at, for instance, Indonesia, the President met with the newly elected President of Indonesia yesterday. It took you know, many years for them to work through uh, elections and uh, constitutional reforms and uh, uh, dealing with uh, different uh, ethnic groups in the country. Um, so we, we're taking a view here in Burma uh, that this is an enormous opportunity for the people inside the country, uh, enormous opportunity for democratization. Uh, however, I think that we are concerned about um, areas where we do not see progress uh, and where we see significant challenges. Uh, and I think there are really three broad categories of issues that we're going to be focused on heading into this visit. Uh, one is the ongoing process of political reform in the country. Um, and again, what I said um, to uh, the people I met with is that we share the same objective here. We share the objective of there being a credible election uh, next year in the parliamentary elections uh, in which the Burmese people can choose uh, their leadership, uh, but also share the objective of supporting a process of constitutional reform inside of Burma. Uh, one election isn't going to fix all the problems. There needs to be constitutional reform uh, that enables there to be a fuller transition from military to civilian, to civilian rule that enables Burma to choose their own leaders. Uh, and the president will definitely be discussing uh, the progress in uh, pro planning for those elections, uh, but also uh, the progress on and the need for constitutional reform. And that's something uh, that he'll talk to Thane Sein and Aung San Suu Kyi about. Um, secondly, uh, there's the issue in Rakhine State. Uh, and here, I think, is, uh, we've seen the most troubling uh, difficulties with the humanitarian situation deteriorating in Rakhine State. A very specific issue having to do with uh, the treatment of the Rohingya population there. Uh, and uh, there, too, I think we share the same objectives of uh, the human rights community. We want to see better humanitarian access uh, to the Rohingya. Uh, to help alleviate the humanitarian situation. Uh, we would like uh, to see a, a long-term plan, an action plan, that does not rely on camps, but rather allows people to settle uh, in communities and pursue uh, development within the country. And we would like to see a process uh, where the Rohingya can become citizens uh, of Burma uh, without having, uh, again, to self-identify um, as something other than who they are, uh, which is uh, uh, citizens, uh, uh, you know, would be prospective citizens of Burma. Um, so uh, there, I think we have been working very hard in the country, uh, working with other countries to try to bring uh, a focus on the uh, situation where Kind State, and there'll certainly be um, front and center in the President's discussions. Then the third area is the uh, ethnic insurgencies uh, and the ceasefires that have been reached. Here, I think the government has made uh, a good deal of progress. They've reached uh, individual um, ceasefires with many of the different ethnic groups. Uh, the Kachin is one that we've been particularly focused on of late. Uh, but they're working to translate that into a nationwide ceasefire uh, that can lead into a process of reconciliation that addresses uh, the underlying issues uh, of ethnic political participation, uh, of ec economic development in the ethnic areas, the role of the military as well. Um, and we believe that there's a real opportunity here uh, for the government to move forward with this plan. But again, it has to be one that doesn't just uh, put a lid on things, but addresses the underlying challenges and works towards uh, the type of uh, federal union that uh, I think uh, has been uh, contemplated in many of the discussions with the ethnic groups. So we're coming at a time uh, where a lot of these are in flux. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, they can be dealt with through politics. And that's new in Burma. Um, that doesn't mean it's perfect, but it means that people are going to get around the table. There's going to be uh, a process for reviewing the constitutional amendments. There's going to be an election. Uh, there are going to be talks uh, ongoing with the ethnic groups. Um, and so 
We want this opening uh, to continue to move forward. We want the trajectory uh, to con continue to be one of progress. Uh, and the United States can best, uh, you know, I think to, to sum up my message, the United States can best move that forward by engagement. If we disengage, uh, frankly, I think that there's a vacuum that could potentially be filled by bad actors. But when we're at the table, when we're uh, pressing these issues, uh, we're bringing more attention to the situation in Rakhine State. Uh, we are working to bring the parties together uh, in the political process. We can help facilitate and support uh, through development assistance uh, the implementation of a nationwide ceasefire. Um, so I covered a lot of ground there, but I, the, the bottom line here is I think that uh, you know, we share the same objective with uh, the advocacy community here. Uh, we're pursuing those objectives through engagement. We're clear-eyed about where there's been progress and where there needs to be more. Uh, and we believe we can best move that along by the president raising this with Thane Sane, with Aung San Suu Kyi. But you'll notice he's also meeting with civil society. He's meeting with young people. Uh, we're sending a message that we're engaging very broadly in this country uh, because we care deeply about its future and we see a real opportunity. But uh, that opportunity can only be seized if they uh, continue moving in the right direction and don't uh, let some of the uh, recent uh, very significant challenges throw the reform off course. Carol? I have one for each of you, actually. Uh, Mike, on the ITA, can you <coughs> explain what the difference this one's going to make to the tech industry, given that tariffs are already kind of low, and how it will <coughs> impact consumers, and if any, China got any concessions in this breakthrough? And then for Ben, you mentioned that Obama and she are going to talk about military and military cooperation. And have you guys, <coughs> confidence building measures, have you guys reached agreements on <coughs> notifying each other about military activities and on a code of conduct for encounters in sea and air? And Josh, on the net neutrality announcement, can you talk about why you guys did that now and what you're trying to accomplish and what sort of pushback you expect from Congress and whether or not the President has talked to Comcast about it? Uh, Mike, why don't we, I'll let you go first. Uh, okay. On this. Do you want to repeat the question for, I think I lost track by the end. <laughs> the benefits of ITA. There you go. Right. What is what is going to make and how it's going to affect consumers? Well, in these tariff reduction agreements, uh, it obviously benefits uh, both the producers who can now sell more of their product, but also the consumers, because they'll see uh, access to products more easily. And when you're talking about medical devices, for example, medical equipment like MRIs and CAT scans and a whole variety of uh, implantable devices. Uh, that means better health care uh, for people all over the world. Um, you know, the tariffs uh, uh, range as high as 25 percent for some of the next generation semiconductors, 30 percent. Uh, for loudspeakers, 30 percent. For certain software media, uh, 30 percent for video game consoles. So there's a some of the, the tariffs are in the 5 to 8 percent range. Some are in the 25 to 30 percent range. And uh, right now, the trade in these covered lines is about a trillion dollars. And we would expect it to grow significantly for the benefit of uh, consumers and the benefit of producers, including a lot of products made in the United States. We export over a billion dollars of these products right now, even with these barriers in place. And that will help support more jobs in the United States. In, in trade negotiations, there's always issues of how how the uh, obligations are phased in over time, and that'll be part of what's discussed in Geneva. You want to repeat the question, Madam? Yeah, sure. It's on the uh, specific nature of the confidence building measures with uh, the Chinese and mil, mil, mil ties. I don't want to get ahead of the discussions, um, but uh, we've certainly been focused on um, both just simply the lines of communication with China, but also uh, how to address some of the challenges we've seen recently, for instance, um, uh, with respect uh, to circumstances where uh, we certainly came a little too close for comfort um, between the United States and Chinese um, military assets. Uh, and so uh, we're looking at what practical things can be done uh, to build confidence and have more transparency. So we'll uh, keep you updated on that. I don't want to get ahead of the leaders. But the, the bottom line principle is, uh, first of all, it's incredibly important that we avoid uh, inadvertent escalation um, uh, and that we uh, don't find ourselves, uh, again, uh, having uh, an accidental circumstance lead into um, uh, something that could precipitate a conflict. Uh, so there's enormous value in that type of dialogue. And the second point, I think, is it's good for the region 
if uh, the United States and China are able to have greater transparency between our militaries. Um, I think that will ultimately promote stability. And we've, inc we've encouraged that type of transparency across uh, the region, uh, whether it's uh, an ASEAN code of conduct uh, or whether it's uh, the type of dialogue that President Xi and Abe had yesterday. This is something that we've been uh, encouraging all of our partners to do, to be more transparent, to build confidence, to develop practical means uh, to avoid inadvertent escalation. So it, it will be a, a, an important topic of their, their uh, meeting, and uh, we'll keep you updated on it. I mean, there, there are those, and then there's just the broader um, nature of our military, military relationship, how we interact, uh, how we have exchanges. Um, so I think we'll have more to say on this, uh, but I don't want to get ahead of the leaders. And then uh, before we move on, to, just on the net neutrality question that you raised earlier, Carol, I, I know that there are members of Congress uh, on both sides of this issue who have made their views known. The, uh, the White House has been in touch with uh, the business community on a variety of issues, as we uh, always are. And I know that this is something that, uh, again, on both sides of this issue, they're very strongly held views. The uh, position that the President articulated in the statement uh, that was released today is consistent with the President's uh, previously expressed strongly held views about the importance uh, of an open Internet, that the Internet has been the source of innovation, uh, that has been uh, good for the economy in particular in the United States, uh, and putting in place a regulatory regime uh, that does not allow um, some of those companies to um, to sort of uh, uh, extend some preferential treatment to some content uh, is an important way that we can protect uh, the freedom and openness that's associated with the internet uh, that will ensure that it continues to be uh, a space uh, that's open to, uh, to innovation and progress. Uh, so we'll, um, but again, this is something that has been, uh, ha has engendered strongly held views on both sides, so I would anticipate this will continue to be uh, a pretty robust debate in the political sphere uh, back home in, uh, in the United States. Uh, I will say that in terms of the timing of this announcement, it was not related to this uh, specific trip, uh, that there are some regulatory decisions that are due, uh, and uh, the President felt like this was an appropriate time uh, to, uh, again, reiterate uh, his views about the important principle that's at stake here. Okay? Ed? Ben, I had a question about Putin in terms of, I know it was just a brief conversation so far, but can you say anything that happened there, but also, more importantly, moving forward, what you hope to accomplish what message you hope to send to Putin? Because uh, in turn, we've heard again and again that sanctions are working against Russia. And certainly we've seen the ruble in the last couple of days. There's been an economic impact. But the administration put out a statement a day or two ago saying that um, heavy artillery and tanks are being sent to the front line basically by Russia. And that's, that's your own assessment. So doesn't that suggest that the sanctions are not stopping them from this heavy influence inside Ukraine? Questions about the exchange between the President, uh, President Obama and President Putin yesterday and the impact uh, of sanctions on uh, influencing Russia's uh, actions in Ukraine. Ben, you want to take it? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, in their interaction, as I think we said last night, um, it was very brief. The leaders greeted each other as the uh, President greeted many leaders. They did not have a substantive exchange that they do today uh, on the margins of APEC, where I think there's a lot more time. I'll certainly let you know. Uh, but, Ed, I think, you know, first on the message and then on the, um, on the situation in Ukraine specifically, uh, you, you know, on Ukraine, uh, we continue to be deeply troubled by Russia's activities. Um, and I guess to, to take your, your question head on, the, the sanctions are clearly succeeding and having an impact on the Russian economy. There's no question that if you look at every metric from the status of the ruble um, to the projections for growth, um, that the Russian economic picture is grim and getting grimmer because of the sanctions. Um, the sanctions have yet, yet to um, sufficiently affect Russia's calculus uh, as it relates to Ukraine. Um, that's why we continue to impose them. That's why um, we continue uh, to be very clear about where we need to see gr uh, better Russian action. Uh, specifically, uh, as you said, uh, we've seen the continued provision of support to the separatists, including uh, heavy weapons uh, that are in complete violation of uh, the spirit of the Minsk agreement. Uh, and what our message is to Russia is there's an agreement that you reached with uh, the government in Kiev, and you must abide by that agreement. The separatists must abide by that agreement. Uh, and escalating the situation by providing these uh, types of weapons into Ukraine is clearly not in service of that process. Um, and what Russia will find is, if they continue to do that, 
Uh, it's a recipe uh, for isolation from a broad swath of the international community. Uh, it's a recipe for the type of economic disruption they've seen uh, from the sanctions going forward. So uh, our message is one of resolve uh, in insisting upon uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Um, it's a message that there is a roadmap here through the Minsk Agreement that should be followed. Um, and uh, the President will certainly, uh, I, I think, uh, express that view publicly and privately uh, in the coming days uh, uh, and weeks. Uh, I think more broadly with Russia, um, I think, uh, you know, at the same time, uh, we've had differences with them on, on Ukraine. Uh, we're working uh, to pursue an Iran agreement. Uh, we're working um, in a range of areas where we can make progress together. Um, but uh, clearly what we've seen is uh, a troubling focus uh, from President Putin on the situation in Ukraine uh, that is going to demand a response from the international community going forward, just as it has the last several months. And the United States is, uh, is, is going to be committed to leading that response. Mark. Thank you. Uh, just a question for Mike, and then a question either for Mike or Ben, depending on who's more appropriate. Um, on the uh, trade talks, um, Mike, I'm paraphrasing, but you said earlier that the best way to get Congress to pass a, a, a TPP deal is to bring them a very good agreement. And some trade analysts say that that sort of has it backwards, that you, you sort of need to get the TPA authority first, because that allows you to obtain the concessions from trading partners. Um, I'm wondering sort of whether you think you can get those concessions without the president having TPA and whether foreign leaders have pressed the president in the wake of the elections to try to get that authority from Congress. And then secondly, on cyber, um, the working group that Secretary Kerry set up uh, on the cybersecurity issues obviously stopped working after the uh, charges were brought against these Chinese military officers for hacking. Um, will President Obama in his talks with President Xi, encourage him, ask him to uh, resume the dialogue with that working group? So just to restate the two issues on the microphone, uh, the, the second question was about the cybersecurity working group and the relationship between the U.S. and China and how the President will raise that with President Xi when they uh, discuss it tomorrow. And then the first question was related to uh, does the ambassador feel as if he can reach uh, uh, a good agreement with other countries without having TPA authority first, right? Okay. Ambassador Frum. Well, our approach has always been to pursue both in parallel and to make clear that ultimately, the, again, as I said, the only guarantee that an agreement gets the support of Congress is that it is a good agreement and meets that ambitious, comprehensive, high standard outcome that we have sought to, uh, uh, sought to achieve. I think there's, we have an ongoing discussion with our trading partners. They follow our political system uh, very, uh, very closely. And uh, we have made clear, and I think they understand, that every country has its domestic processes to go through on trade agreements. And we're responsible for ours, and they're responsible for theirs. Uh, and as the President has made clear uh, that he wants to work with uh, leaders in Congress, uh, Republican and Democratic leaders of Congress, to advance the trade agenda, uh, that has allowed our negotiations to continue. So we're continuing to work in parallel to close out the TPP negotiations, consistent with the high standard that we've set for ourselves. And we're continuing to work with Congress to achieve a trade promotion authority with as broad bipartisan support as possible. Ben, you want to do the cyber? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mark, it, um, it, uh, it's certainly the case that after uh, those charges were brought, we did see um, uh, a chill in the cyber dialogue. Uh, I think the fact that we pursued um, uh, those cases demonstrates that uh, we're not going to simply stand idly by if we see activity. Uh, that we don't like, that we can call out, we're going to do that. At the same time, though, we do believe that it's better if there's a mechanism for dialogue where we can raise concerns uh, directly with one another. Uh, so uh, I think President Obama will um, uh, uh, highlight the importance uh, of having a means to have a cyber dialogue so that uh, our governments can share information. We can be direct about uh, areas of concern. Uh, we can try to find ways uh, to build confidence in that space as well. So um, it is something where uh, we've been very uh, firm in our position. Uh, we did see uh, a Chinese reaction uh, to those charges. Uh, again, we're going to continue to call out behavior as we see it. But uh, I think the message in the, in the bylaw today, and as it has been going forward, is uh, better for us uh, to have a means uh, to have a dialogue, just as we've done a whole host of other issues through the strategic and economic dialogue, um, so that uh, we can be more transparent. Major. 
Ben, on uh, Ukraine, I'm just trying to get a sense if the President wants to use this venue or the G20 as an opportunity to engage Putin directly and say what's happening in Ukraine right now, which seems to be an escalation after several months of relative call, to protest in a very specific way and to convey that message to him directly. Secondarily, can you in any way, shape, or form provide any clarity on the status of al -Baghdad? So uh, just repeat the two questions. The first is, does the President plan to raise directly with President Putin the concerns that the United States has uh, about their actions in Ukraine, either while we're here uh, at APEC or in the context of the G20 meetings? Uh, and then an update on the uh, latest assessment about uh, the strike against uh, ISIL that may have uh, had impact on al-Baghdadi. Al ben, do you want to do this? Sure. Well, Major, I, I think uh, our position on Ukraine is well known and it's manifested in our sanctions and our policy. So, uh, you know, I don't think we're uh, necessarily looking to focus um, uh, to, to make this a uh, to go out of our way to try to make the focus of these multilateral meetings uh, Ukraine uh, in the way that we did when we were in Europe when it was uh, obviously a more natural venue. That said, uh, I think if the President has the opportunity to talk to uh, President Putin, um, you know, I know he'll be expressing the need to uh, highlight uh, and get back to the Minsk agreement and express concern over these latest reports. I also know that other leaders share those concerns as well. And yesterday, for instance, with Prime Minister Abbott, um, we discussed the situation in Ukraine. He's obviously very focused um, on the MH17 investigation uh, and the need for there to be justice for Australian families. Um, so it's not simply the United States. Uh, you have a number of leaders, Chancellor Merkel, Prime Minister Abbott, a number of other European leaders, Prime Minister uh, Cameron, uh, who uh, share our concerns. And so um, this is uh, not just simply a U.S. view. I think it's probably held um, among many of our uh, friends and allies. Um, and so uh, I can't predict exactly what will happen except to say that uh, I know where different nations stand and I know that that's what they've been saying to the Russians. I've been that you don't consider what's happening right now to be particularly alarming. Do consider it to be particularly alarming. That's why we've spoken out about it. Uh, what, I guess what I'm saying is our position is very clear on this, uh, and the path, the pathway out of this is very clear. It's to get back to the Minsk agreement, um, and the pattern of imposing consequences on Russia when we've seen escalation is also established as well. Um, so again, I, I could anticipate, knowing how these meetings go, that as the president has an opportunity to engage with leaders like Chancellor Merkel, for instance, on the margins of the uh, G20, um, this will certainly come up. Um, and uh, again, again I, I was just highlighting that uh, President Putin knows full well where we stand, um, and we've made that clear through not just our words, but our policies, our sanctions, um, and that's can continue to be um, uh, our approach here. Um, on Baghdadi, uh, uh, we cannot confirm uh, his status uh, at this point. Uh, as you know, we did uh, take uh, a strike um, that uh, successfully uh, hit uh, a number of ISIL vehicles uh, that we assessed was associated with uh, ISIL leadership. Um, we obviously take time uh, to do due diligence to get an understanding of what uh, the impact was. The message, I think, is very clear, though, which is that we're not going to allow for a safe haven uh, for ISIL and its leadership and its fighters in Iraq or Syria. Uh, and they had that for months. Uh, they were able to operate freely. Uh, and I think what they're finding now, whether it's outside of Kobani, whether it's in Anbar province, whether it's in northern Iraq, uh, whether it was that strike outside of Mosul, uh, that if they move, we're going to hit them. I don't have an update on his, on his status now. Josh. Um, two for Ben, um, the first one on Indonesia and the second one on China. Um, at the meetings yesterday, were there any yesterday uh, between the president and, and President um, uh, Widodo? Uh, was there any discussion of uh, Hambali, the terrorist uh, suspect that's been locked up at Guantanamo for more than 10 years? I think President Bush at one point promised to return him to Indonesia for trial, um, regardless of whether it came up. Um, what, what's going to happen to that individual? Um, is there any plan to do anything with him or just keep him at Guantanamo indefinitely? Um, and then on the Chinese front, um, you know, given the uh, concerns about press freedom in China, um, uh, can you explain the President's decision to do a written interview with um, the Xinhua uh, agency since the Chinese leaders have been criticized in the past for insisting on sort of canned interviews with um, American news outlets? The two questions, uh, did the President discuss with the Indonesian leader the status of uh, an Indonesian uh, terror suspect that's being held at Guantanamo uh, and the decision-making behind uh, the President's decision to do uh, a written interview with Xinhua? 
Ben, you want to take this? Yeah. Um, well, on the first question, it did not come up um, in the discussion. Uh, Counterterrorism did, ISIL did. Um, we discussed ways to share information, um, and we have a good relationship with Indonesia on information sharing related to counterterrorism. Um, and so those issues were addressed. But on his specific status, uh, I'll have to check Josh on, on exactly what the status of his case is. As you know, we've reviewed each one and um, ha have uh, uh, a very rigorous process to determine who is cleared for transfer, uh, who is not. Um, so uh, we can get back to you on that. Um, on the uh, second question, um, look, it's very, um, uh, when we go on trips, uh, this is something we do everywhere. We do, uh, we, as, you, as you know from covering us, uh, we tend to do written interviews with um, uh, outlets uh, when we, when we uh, arrive in a country. Um, our view is, uh, on the one hand, uh, we need to engage, and the more the president's uh, voice can be heard in a country, uh, the better, because people understand where we come from. Um, so we do engage uh, Chinese media. We engage CCTV in the briefing room every day. Uh, we engage in Ha. Um, at the same time, uh, we'll raise issues of press freedom. Uh, and the president has raised it directly with President Xi uh, in their bilateral meetings. Uh, we've raised uh, our concerns about uh, the status of some U.S. media organizations. Um, and. Uh, the uh, treatment of uh, the adjudication of their visas. We've raised, uh, again, our concern on having uh, more free access to information here, uh, not just as it relates to the news media, but as it relates to the internet. Um, so these are things that we will uh, consistently raise, but uh, again, I think better for the president's voice uh, to get out and to be heard in a country. We use uh, uh, th uh, those interviews as important venues to uh, address different issues, um, but in no way does that diminish the fact that uh, we uh, have concerns about press freedom here in China, just as we do in a range of other countries that we visited um, uh, who, have, uh, who are on a spectrum of how they treat uh, the press. Mr. Acosta? Uh, yeah, uh, just to follow up on that with Ben, um, what does the President see as his legacy with China? Is it more engaging with China but not changing China's behavior? Uh, because I, you know, I was struck by something the President said yesterday uh, with Prime Minister Abbott, uh, that you know, press freedom, human rights, that those are U.S. values, but uh, he does not expect China to have those traditions to follow those traditions. Uh, why not? Why not publicly, with Xi, uh, push the Chinese uh, to adopt more American values when it comes to press freedom and human rights? Just repeat the question again. Uh, so Jim's question is about uh, how aggressively the president pushes uh, the Chinese. Uh, on some of the human rights concerns that uh, the president himself has spoken about pretty publicly. Yeah. And how that's new the relationship. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the, the human rights piece. Um, you know, Jim, um, the president doesn't just see these as uh, American values. There are certain things that are universal values. Um, they're embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at the United Nations, uh, and they should be able to take root uh, in uh, any society. Uh, when you talk about uh, freedom of spree speech, freedom of association, uh, again, America has championed those values, but we believe uh, that they are universal. I, I think what the President was speaking about is the fact that China is at a different stage of development, uh, obviously it has different traditions, but uh, we do raise these issues and we do believe uh, that certain things are universal. The right to, uh, uh, to uh, again, speak your mind, uh, access information, uh, to freedom of assembly. Um, and so. Uh, it's something that we're going to press. Um, it's something that comes up in every meeting. It's something we raise uh, publicly as well. Um, and uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, again, I think uh, the people of China are going to determine the, the future of their country. But uh, we want to make sure that uh, just as we want China to live up to the rules of the road and other things, uh, we want them to live up to the rules of the road on universal values. In a place like Hong Kong, uh, that involves respect for freedom of assembly. It also involves the people of Hong Kong being able to select their own leaders, as was agreed to, uh, to choose their own uh, uh, leadership, uh, again, which was the one country, two systems uh, notion. In terms of the president's legacy, um, you know, I think uh, there's, what did we get done with China um, on a bilateral basis to, uh, again, improve the American economy, to save the global economy, and coordinated action with China was critical to that, um, uh, to take the types of steps we've taken on this trip that will promote uh, U.S. exports, uh, promote more uh, tourism investment in the United States, all that will have a positive economic impact uh, uh, for America and the American people. Uh, then I think, however, we want to look at where do we enlist China uh, in regional and global efforts? Because um, again, we want them to play a bigger role. We want them to be a part of 
international climate negotiations, because you can't deal with climate change unless China is coming to the table in a serious way. Uh, we want them to be a, a part of settling disputes and resolving uh, disputes uh, in the, uh, around maritime security in the, in the region. Uh, we want them to be a part of pursuing an agreement uh, with Iran over its nuclear program. So China kind of fits into the type of international order we're trying to uh, build in which nations are invested in, in solving problems. Uh, and that very much speaks to the, the rebalance, the signature uh, Asia-Pacific policy of the presence. Uh, we want to see this region uh, more prosperous, more cooperative, uh, again, uh, a place of robust American in engagement uh, in ways that support our economy, uh, support the security of our allies and stability of the region, uh, support uh, the values we care about in a place like Burma where we have a, an ongoing transition, uh, and that uh, mitigates uh, the risk of conflict that could derail the extraordinary progress we see here. Uh, so again, when we look at his legacy, it's going to be where did we move the ball forward bilaterally in ways that benefit the American people? How did we embed China uh, working with them in an international system that can solve problems uh, like uh, climate change and security? Um, and how is this region uh, a more stable, prosperous, and secure place uh, which, which has robust American engagement? They're critical to all those things. And human rights, uh, in our view, is a part of the international norms that we uphold. Um, so just as we care about maritime security and cybersecurity, we care about uh, universal values. And that, uh, that's going to be a part of how uh, we uh, judge the status of the relationship. And you mentioned Iran a couple of times. If I could just follow up on that. November 24th is coming up very quickly. Do you see a scenario where that deadline might have to be pushed back a bit? Have you seen Netanyahu's comments uh, where he seems to be pretty upset about the comedy, including about the elimination of Israel? Is that far from that? So, the yeah, so the question was uh, the status of the Iran negotiations heading to the 24th uh, and uh, the Israeli Prime Minister's comments on uh, the Supreme Leader's tweet. Um, on, the, uh, on the first question, um, uh, what we've been focused on is driving towards uh, what progress can we make towards an agreement uh, for the 24th. We have not focused in discussions uh, with Iran on uh, extending those discussions because we want to keep the focus on closing gaps. Uh, Secretary Kerry was meeting uh, into the night in Oman. Uh, he's currently on a plane set to arrive in Beijing. He will give the President uh, an update uh, on where things stand, on what progress he made. Um, so President Obama will hear directly from him uh, about the status of the talks. Uh, and then there are negotiations scheduled in Vienna uh, where we'll see where we can get by the 24th and we'll uh, keep people posted on uh, where things stand. With respect to the First of all, the sentiments expressed by the Supreme Leader's office in that tweet, uh, they're obviously outrageous. Uh, it's a type of rhetoric we've seen uh, from uh, the Iranian leadership uh, for years. Uh, we completely reject it, of course. Um, the fact of the matter is what we've always said is, uh, even as we pursue this effort around diplomacy on the Iranian nuclear program, that's about addressing a security concern of the United States and Israel and the international community. Uh, if we can prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, that's uh, in, in all of our interests. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't lessen our concern uh, over other Iranian behaviors, uh, including uh, the virulent anti-Israeli rhetoric that uh, has been a part of their political tr uh, tradition. Uh, so we'll continue to speak out against that. Um, with respect to the agreement itself, though, what we would say is, again, if we can verifiably discern that Iran is not building a nuclear weapon, uh, that its program is for peaceful purposes, that's a good thing. That's far better uh, than an outcome where Iran is back to uh, trying to uh, accumulate more stockpile, enriching at a higher percent, uh, and, and getting more breakout capacity. So we've already frozen their nuclear, uh, the progress of the nuclear program. Uh, we've rolled back the, the stockpile just during these negotiations. Uh, if we can get a conference of agreement, we would say uh, that be in the interest uh, of uh, American national security and also the security of our friends and allies. Okay. We're nearing the one hour mark here, so we'll just do two more. Uh, Chingy and then Jim Offlow will let you wrap up, okay? Can you go ahead? Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, first question is to Ambassador Froman. Uh, in, according to an interview with Xinhua, President Obama said our summit will also be an opportunity to make progress toward an ambitious bilateral investment treaty. So what kind of progress, what kind of breakthrough that we can expect about the, uh, the, uh, the BIT? And also the second, second question is to Ben. Uh, other than ITA and, v and the visa, what else uh, deliverables that the U.S. is looking forward to, to reaching this time? Thank you. Just repeat the question so everybody can hear. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ambassador Froman, uh, an update on progress related to the BIT negotiations. 
uh, and Ben, what other sort of deliverable, deliverables you anticipate out of the meetings between President Obama and President Xi? Ambassador Froman. Well, as you, uh, as you may recall, uh, it was about a year and a half ago that China agreed to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty on the basis of what we call a negative list, which is to open up their economy, but for specific carve-outs that they negotiate uh, with us. And that was a major step forward, as were some of the other uh, provisions that we agreed to then. Since that time, we've had very good discussions in the bilateral investment treaty channel. Uh, we've had uh, a series of rounds to walk through our model bit and to talk about how it would be applied in the case of, uh, of China. Um, we have further work to, to do. Uh, next year, China, early next year, China has agreed to uh, give us their first version of their negative list, and it will be uh, very important uh, if we're to achieve uh, uh, early progress in these negotiations that that list be as short and as focused, as narrowly tailored uh, as possible, and we're encouraging our Chinese counterparts, including while we're here for this visit and, and around this summit, to focus on making that list as narrow and as short uh, as possible so that we can proceed with negotiations and make progress next year. Um, I, I, of course, will let the uh, leaders speak to the um, specific deliverables. Uh, I think you know, we certainly focused on um, the visa issue and uh, ITA in these first couple of days uh, because of the economic theme uh, of APEC and the venue of the CEO forum. Um, so uh, again, I think the President's meeting uh, will certainly address economic issues, but uh, I think we'll also delve into these political security and global issues that I, I spoke about. Uh, so I think we'll be looking for progress uh, in those areas. Um, uh, and again, some of these are specific outcomes. Some of these are just uh, uh, how are we coordinated on something like Iran and North Korea? Um, so we'll, we'll certainly keep you posted. But uh, the agenda laid out, I laid out at the beginning are the areas where we're looking uh, for progress. Um, and, uh, and we expect that we'll make some. And I, I think, if, actually, if we look back, um, uh, you know, w we feel very good about the opportunity to come out of this uh, uh, summit having moved the ball forward uh, in a number of areas economically, uh, on our military relationship, uh, on our cooperation. Uh, globally on, uh, on, on certain issues. Uh, so I think it speaks to the fact that the relationship is, is dynamic. We can move forward in spaces. But uh, we're also going to, I'm sure, leaving here disagreeing about uh, a number of things, whether it's cyber or human rights, as we, as we discussed. So we'll, we'll keep you posted, though, as uh, the leaders make progress tonight in the dinner uh, and then uh, tomorrow in their bilateral. Mr. Avila, I'll give you the last one. Recent actions have become a recipe for isolation from the international community, yet we sit here in the second largest uh, economy, where certainly that's not the case. Uh, have the American and European sanctions actually uh, driven Russia and China closer together, and is America concerned about that? The question is, uh, is there a concern that the uh, efforts by the United States and our uh, partners in Western Europe to isolate the Russian regime, has it actually had the effect of driving Russia and China closer together? Well, first of all, I think, um, uh, look, you're never, uh, in, we would not intend to, uh, nor are you ever going to completely uh, isolate uh, a country as big as Russia that plays uh, a role in a number of issues. And in fact, we continue to cooperate with them, for instance, on, on Iran negotiations. Uh, however, uh, we do want to isolate them around the issue of Ukraine. Um, and the fact of the matter is, we've been able to work with a, a broad coalition of our friends and allies. Um, and clearly, the nations that have stepped up uh, most robustly uh, are our European allies, Canada, Australia, a number of our partners here in Asia, like Japan, have, uh, have stepped up as well. Uh, you've seen the G8 move to the G7. Um, so clearly, there has been uh, an economic impact from uh, that isolation that can be seen in the declining ruble, declining growth rates. Uh, the projections for Russia's economic future are much worse today than they were a year ago. That's because of uh, the isolation that has been imposed on them by a coalition of countries led by the United States. Um, China obviously has not uh, traditionally uh, joined efforts to impose economic sanctions on other countries. That's frankly why it was such a significant breakthrough uh, to get them to do that on uh, Iran and get them to reduce their purchases of uh, Iranian oil. With respect to the Chinese-Russian uh, relationship, um, look, they've always had a degree of cooperation. Um, but what I would say is that if, uh, if Russia uh, has to look more uh, specifically uh, just here, uh, that disadvantages Russia as well. Um, 
they didn't get the best deal uh, that they could have gotten, for instance, uh, on the energy partnership that was uh, announced uh, recently. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that they don't have a lot of venues uh, to do business these days. Um, so again, uh, we understand that there's going to continue to be ch cooperation between Russia and China. That's uh, part of the dynamic internationally. Um, but the fact of the matter is we can do a lot uh, working with a broad coalition of countries on Ukraine. Um, and in the long term, um, it's not a good bet for Russia to limit the places uh, that it can do business. That's clearly going to have a harmful impact. Uh, you know, China is, is clearly more broadly engaged right now. Um, and uh, uh, again, I think that um, uh, Russia puts itself at a disadvantage if it, if it has a, a limited customers uh, for, um, for its exports, uh, if it has limited uh, access to the international community uh, to do business. Uh, we want Russia to play a different role. Uh, we, we want Russia to uh, be a stabilizing force, to work together on issues that uh, we care about, like nuclear security and nonproliferation and uh, European security. Um, but uh, they're not going to be able to do that, uh, certainly specifically to uh, European security, if they're violating the sovereignty of a, a country next door. So this will be something that we continue to focus on. But uh, again, stepping back, uh, I think the message of our whole trip here is, the United States is in a good position. Uh, our economy is growing. Uh, we've re rebounded well uh, from uh, the financial crisis. Uh, we have uh, been able uh, to bring home substantial amounts of U.S. troops from 180,000 U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to uh, be 10,000 at the end of the year. That's freed up resources for us to have uh, a broader counterterrorism platform. Uh, we're addressing global issues like climate change, nonproliferation. Um, so we feel very good about how we're positioned in this region uh, and the world. But what we want to put in place, whether it's trade, whether it's maritime security, cyber, uh, what have you, uh, is an international uh, order where those nations who play within the rules uh, are incentivized uh, and prosper. Uh, and those nations uh, that are working outside of the rules, as Russia is doing in Ukraine, uh, pay a cost. That's the theory that we can bring to all these meetings. Uh, and I think it bears out that you stand more to gain um, by uh, playing by the rules uh, than you do by uh, being outside of them. Uh, and that's been a driving force in our engagement with China. Uh, it's a driving force in our engagement with all, all countries. Thanks very much, everybody.